Welcome back everyone. This will be my full Star Wars The Book of Boba Fett episode 1 video. There were a whole bunch of easter eggs and references, so we'll break it all down. If you're brand new to the channel, I'll be doing videos for all the episodes, so be sure to subscribe to get them all. We're also doing a giveaway for Disney Plus memberships. All you have to do to enter is be a subscriber and just leave your favorite moment from the episode on the video. There'll be seven episodes total if you guys didn't know, so we'll be running all the way week to week into January and February. And this will help set up what's going on during The Mandalorian Season 3. This is meant to be kind of like The Mandalorian Season 2.5. As you see, it picks up after the events of The Mandalorian Season 2 post credit scene, where Boba Fett goes and kills Bib Fortuna. But careful for spoilers from the episode, if you have not seen it yet, we'll just start at the beginning and go through shot by shot, talking about Easter eggs, WTF moments, and references as we go along. Starting with the episode title, Chapter 1, Stranger in a Strange Land, which is a reference to Boba Fett being taken in by the Tusken Raiders after he escapes the Sarlacc, and sort of being a stranger to the culture of being a crime boss. Like, there are a couple times later in the episode when Fennec Shan says, this would go easier if you just accepted their ways, like the ways of the other criminal underworld underbosses. Stranger in a Strange Land is also a direct reference to a Robert Heinlein novel of the same name, and that's about a man who's raised on Mars but then comes to Earth and has to acclimate to Terran life and culture. But as you can see, because this is part of the Mandalorian universe, like it's a Mandalorian spinoff, they're using chapters the same way the Mandalorian series uses chapters to mark each of the different episodes. But even though this is meant to be a spinoff of the Mandalorian and set during the same timeline after the events of season two, the reason why they're starting over with chapter one is to just distinguish it as its own small mini-series thing. Like, there's only supposed to be one season of the Book of Boba Fett, but the idea is that they'll do this for other characters in the series, so eventually they might do the same thing for, say, like, Bo-Katan Kryze or other major Star Wars characters. But the actual opening scene from the episode basically recaps everything that happened to Boba Fett after he went into the Sarlacc and Return of the Jedi. Like, we knew we were going to get that story, but they basically opened the episode with that. But the way they start on Jabba's palace at night while Boba Fett's asleep in the Bacta chamber, the regeneration chamber, is meant to be one kind of a Darth Vader reference because Darth Vader, Anakin Skywalker, basically has to spend every waking hour when he's not in the armor inside a Bacta tank healing his damage. But it's also meant to be a more specific callback to the Return of the Jedi scene where everyone in Jabba's court is sleeping, pretending to sleep in some cases, when Princess Leia comes back to rescue Han Solo. Like you're entering Jabba's palace at night while everyone is asleep. But because Boba Fett has been cleaning house in Jabba's palace, so to speak, in present day, there aren't that many people. That's why the throne room itself is empty. But they basically start on the throne itself because that's so important to the actual series, him claiming Jabba's throne. I believe the writing on the throne itself is meant to be in Huttese because that's Jabba's language. It also has carvings of the Rancor on both sides of it because Jabba kept Rancors as pets for many, many years. Ludwig Göransson did the theme music for The Book of Boba Fett just like he did the theme music for The Mandalorian series, and as you could probably tell, they're trying to do it in the same style as The Mandalorian theme music, but with much darker overtones because this is less of a space western like Mando is in more of a crime thriller like The Godfather in Space. Boba Fett being the godfather in this situation. They flash back to his earliest memories of his childhood on Kamino during Attack of the Clones because he is very literally a clone of Jango Fett, just raised without any special enhancements to accelerate the aging process. Like he was meant to be a completely unaltered clone. Then him finding Jango Fett's helmet after Mace Windu beheaded him. This party's over. Then he has PTSD flashbacks to his time in the Sarlacc pit. We get a much bigger scene of him escaping the Sarlacc pit. There's been a couple versions of this that they've depicted in the Legends canon, like the really old stuff, and then the newer stuff as well. So if you ever wondered what it looked like inside the belly of a Sarlacc, well now you know. He sees the body of a stormtrooper nearby who's half digested, stealing his air supply just to get a breath, and as you guessed it, uses his flamethrower because Mandalorians love their flamethrowers. Like Mando used it in almost every single episode of season 2 and season 1. But he uses the flamethrower to burn his way out of the Sarlacc so that he can climb the rest of the way through the sand. Nearby, you can see the wreckage of Jabba's sail barge. He wasn't in the Sarlacc for that long. Like, he was in there for a good long while, but I think that he'd been out of the Sarlacc for at least a year or two by the time we see him during the Mandalorian Season 2, Episode 1. Like, he'd been living with the Tusken Raiders for a good long while, as we see him meet them for the first time during this episode. But then the Jawas show up to steal all his armor off of him, and that's obviously where Cobb Vanth bought the armor from. Like, he says, oh, I bought it off a bunch of Jawas. That was actually right out of the brand new Star Wars books. Cobb Vanth was a newer character they introduced after Disney bought Star Wars. 
Maybe we'll see Timothy Oliphant come back on the show because he is still around and on Tatooine, but they leave him for dead until the Tusken Raiders come find him and take him back to their community, just sort of dragging him along the chain gang. I'm guessing we're going to flash back a couple times to this camp of Tusken Raiders as he slowly becomes part of their community. Most of you probably just got done seeing the Dune movie. Obviously, we have the Fremen during that. If you didn't know, the Sand People, the Tusken Raiders, are inspired by the Fremen from the Dune series. So you see a couple times in the episode them using water in really efficient ways, just like the Fremen do during the Dune series. Like they use the water and the fluid from the insects' juices to revive Boba Fett so that they can take him back so that he won't die on the way back. Later in the episode, you see him being forced to dig for little gourds that contain water and moisture that they can use to drink. And because we go back to the Tuscans camp during day, you actually see much more of their people, like you see a bunch of younglings, which reminds you of Anakin Skywalker killing all the Tuscan Raider younglings during Attack of the Clones. The children, too. They're like animals, and I slaughtered them like animals. You notice another Rodian nearby who's also being held captive like them with a massive hound nearby. They're kind of like the fearsome dog-like, wolf-like creatures that they domesticate on Tatooine and use as hunting dogs. We saw Mando treat one like a pet during Mandalorian Season 2 Episode 1. Like, he's figured it out. He knows a little bit about Tusken Raider culture. Boba Fett is kind of learning about it on the fly. They use some of these scenes, though, to give you an idea for what his character is like and what his morals are, what his code is that he lives by. Like, he spares the life of this youngling here when he could have killed him. Like, he's not as bad as Anakin Skywalker was. Like, I might be a scoundrel, I might be a degenerate, but I'm not going to go kill all these younglings. But this is also meant to be a parallel for the Mandalorians just in general. Like, Din Djarin was not born a Mandalorian. He was taken into their culture and adopted their creed, their customs, becoming one of them. So Boba Fett kind of does the same thing throughout the first couple of episodes here, probably. Becoming one of them, at least briefly, till he can get his ship and his armor back. Finding a new respect for the Tusken Raider people. Then he has to hold court because now that he's sitting on Jabba's throne, he has all these vassals that he has to treat with and take tribute from them. Sitting at court, listening to his subjects the same way any king would in a classic setting. They do a big suit-up montage. Obviously, this is a big difference from the Mandalorian series because Mando mostly does not take his helmet off, even though that's kind of changed in the last season or so. Always love a suit-up montage, but the other cool thing here is that you just get a reminder for all the different weapons that he has all over his body. They make a C-3PO Return of the Jedi reference when they both say they need a protocol droid so that they can actually understand what all the different aliens are saying. The droid that they actually do have announcing everyone is an 8D8 droid. He's another droid from Jabba's palace in Return of the Jedi whose original function was to just assist EV-99. The Doc Strassi Transdotion character, who's a local administrator of one of the city centers on Tatooine, as Boba Fett says, his former employer when he was a bounty hunter, is also played by Robert Rodriguez. If you didn't recognize him, he's kind of changing his voice just a little bit. I believe he's also playing the Moke Shays Mayor of Mos Espa character, the Ithorian that we see in the other trailers, that they really only reference during episode one here. You hear his voice speaking during the trailers, and it sounds just like Robert Rodriguez's voice. Who is this who enters unannounced? No damn well. So it just sounds like Robert Rodriguez is playing multiple characters throughout the series. He's basically the showrunner, the director of all these episodes. So the other funny reference here, when the Doc Strassi Transdotion character is talking to him, and he says, that's weird, I used to work for him, it's also meant to be a meta joke about Temuera Morrison himself literally working for him while they're filming all these Book of Boba Fett episodes. It seems that the tribute that he brought him is a Bantha Pelt. But all these scenes with him meeting these people, taking tribute, is just meant to show you the dynamic he has with the rest of the criminal underworld on Tatooine. When they reference Mos Espa, like, may you never leave Mos Espa, that's just where the city center this character manages is. And Mos Espa is also the city where Jabba held the pod races during Phantom Menace. It's just one of the other really major cities on Tatooine next to Mos Eisley, one of the other major spaceports. So them mentioning it here also foreshadows them going there physically later in the episode, like that's the city they travel to later. We'll probably visit a couple different cities on Tatooine during the series. But then, like I said, they reference this Moke Shays, Mayor of Mos Espa character, who sounds like he's going to be one of the major antagonists early in the series. This character is meant to be his Major Dormo, another Twi'lek, just like Bib Fortuna was Jabba's Major Dormo, and they're just creating a little bit of drama here with their relationship. Like, no, 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 you're supposed to be giving us tribute. No, no, the mayor didn't come here, but he does send his thanks. So it's just meant to be this big political dick swinging contest between the two of them. And we see Boba Fett visiting him during the trailers, like I said. So it sounds like they will have a big gunslinger standoff moment eventually. 
Boba Fett isn't a psychopath, but he doesn't suffer fools either. Like Fennec Shan mentions Jabba's menagerie. Like back in the day, if you'd have looked at Jabba the wrong way, he would have fed you to the Rancor. Jabba's menagerie is just meant to be a reference to his small zoo of exotic animals and monsters like the Rancor. So there are other monsters that he kept. It wasn't just the Rancor. But there will be some trap dooring happening during the series. Like you can't have scenes in Jabba's throne room with the trap door without actually using it on someone at some point. You also notice Fennec Shand is calling him Lord Fett now because Boba Fett is now Crime Lord as they call Jabba Lord Jabba. They also use this scene with the Gamorrean guards to give you a better sense of Boba Fett's code. Like it's not the same code as the Mandalorians like I said or Mando's code. It's not quite as hardcore as that but he says he doesn't torture people. But that doesn't mean that he's a nice guy. He'll still kill you on the spot if you cross him which they sort of pay off later in the episode with the big fight in the streets against the other assassins. I'm not sure who this other new bounty hunter character behind them is in the armor but if you think you know write it below in the comments. Then we go back to Mos Espa like we saw during Phantom Menace just give you a slightly different view of the city. I'm not sure which droid this giant walker in the background is that's walking past them but these robot dogs kind of remind me of the real life Boston Dynamics robot dogs like a slightly different version like they changed them just a little bit but it's the same basic build in real life as those dancing robots that you probably saw those internet videos of. There are a couple new characters and aliens droids that they introduced during the episode but most of them are characters or versions of characters that you've seen in the older movies, the original trilogy or the prequel movies. Fennec Shand references Jabba's litter, like the giant floating platform that he always traveled around on, mostly because he got too big and fat, but also the idea that people took it as a sign of power and they might think him weaker for not using something like that, which is also something that they pay off with the big street fight with the assassins. Like, no, I'm not weaker just because I walk around on my own two legs. The name's Boba Fett, put some respect on it. Then we actually see Max Rebo's band, at least a new form of the band, from the Mos Eisley Cantina. We've been to the Mos Eisley Cantina a couple times during the present day of the Mandalorian series and it kind of seems like it's fallen on hard times, like it's more of a toned down dive bar now. So maybe because this bar seems like it's thriving so much in Mos Espa, that's why Max Rebo's band has come here. It looks like they've added an R5 droid as one of their drummers. The episode notes just lists this song that they're playing is a variation of the classic Cantina song theme music from A New Hope. But the bar in general is just meant to feel like the scene from A New Hope in the Mos Eisley Cantina with a lot of the same aliens. Like a lot of these aliens will look familiar to people. They have a bunch of R5 droids serving drinks which is another reference to Jabba forcing R2-D2 to serve drinks on a sail barge during Return of the Jedi. The dealer droid working the sabacc table seems familiar. If you remember where they've used this before just write it below in the comments. I can't remember the last time I saw this. But if you couldn't tell they are playing sabacc. Then we meet Madame Garza Fwip, the owner of the bar here, which is called The Sanctuary. She's another Twi'lek, but she's being played by Jennifer Beals, one of their first big celebrity cameos in the show. I'm sure there's going to be plenty more of these, plenty more recognizable actors showing up playing other alien characters. She seems like one of the very few people so far on the show that we've met who's willing to play ball with him right away, like she gets it right away and they return their helmets filled with tribute. One of the other big differences between him and the Mando is that he offers his helmet up to be cleaned. He gives it away basically to the two Twi'lek servants. Mando would probably just as soon kill someone who tried to take his helmet. But obviously it's meant to be set up for the payoff of them getting the helmets back with a ton of tribute inside them. The whole fear versus respect mantra that Fennec Shand has just sets up the street fight with the other assassins and it's a vicious takedown like they wind up killing most of them and then taking one of them back. Like he legit smashes one of them with the same moves he used with his gaffy stick from Mando season 2 and legit just blows one of them up with one of his rocket launchers. It's a pretty decent close quarters brawl fight. You just see him soaking a ton of damage like he is really tough but then like right after he tells the Gamorrean guards take me to the Bakta tank immediately. Because even before the fight he still had severe damage from the Sarlacc that was still in the process of healing so he's already operating at a physical deficit. They also use this to sort of give you an idea for what Fennec Shan's abilities are with hand-to-hand -hand combat. We've seen her sharpshooter skills during the Mandalorian season 2 but we haven't seen a lot of her close combat abilities. But as a lot of you probably suspected based on the scene earlier when he was holding court talking to the Twi'lek who was serving the mayor of Mos Espa, it was probably the mayor who hired these assassins because he left them with a threat saying don't be surprised if you get visited by another delegation. The assassins are probably meant to be that next delegation. But then back in the Bakta tank he flashes back again to the Tusken Raiders again forward in the timeline. They finally pay off him being accepted into their society after he saves that youngling from the giant creature in the desert. When you see these moisture farmers being attacked by the gang of Reg Nictos, we actually saw Boba Fett taking them out in one of the trailers so he'll probably pay them back in kind for what they did to this moisture farmer here. 
The symbol they spray paint on the building is just the symbol of their gang, so Boba Fett can identify them later. The scene in general is meant to give you kind of a PTSD flashback for Owen and Beru Lars during A New Hope getting attacked and killed by the stormtroopers. When Boba Fett is talking about escaping, he references Anchorhead because it's a big spaceport. We'll probably visit that later in the series. RIP to this Rodian though, when the giant Goro Mortal Kombat looking creature with four arms pops out of the sand to kill them. It didn't seem like he really had that much interest in escaping anyway, so this seems kind of like a mercy killing for him. I'm not sure what kind of creature this is meant to be though. I think that they created it brand new for the series, but it could be some easter egg or reference for something from the deep lore. In the show notes, they just call it a quote unquote sand creature, which is why I think that it's a brand new creature for the show. And most of you probably picked up on this while he was killing it, but the way Boba Fett kills it, strangling it with his prisoner's chain is meant to be a big callback to Return of the Jedi for the way Princess Leia killed Jabba the Hutt with her own chains. The leader of the settlement giving him the gourd of water is just meant to be a sign that they've accepted him as one of their own, like, okay, you're cool, dude. Then just like during the Mandalorian series, over the end credits, they have the concept art depicting the plot of the series. Notice in one of these, they have a C-3PO droid head on a little platter on the floor here in Jabba's throne room. Didn't see that in the actual episode, but I do love the funny Easter egg here. But just to explain what's going on with the other Mandalorian characters while this is happening in present day, it's been a small time jump since the end of Mandalorian Season 2. Mando still has the Darksaber, he's still with Bo-Katan and the Night Owls trying to rally more support, steal more supplies and ships from the Empire. Grogu is still traveling around the galaxy with Luke Skywalker doing his Jedi training while they're also looking for other Force-sensitive candidates for Luke to train. If you did spot any other big easter eggs or references in the episode that I didn't mention in the video, just post them below in the comments. Like I said, you'll see a lot of familiar references to aliens, creatures, places, things from the original trilogy on Tatooine, as well as the Mandalorian Season 1 and 2 and the prequel movies that took place on Tatooine like Phantom Menace. My full Boca Boba Fett Episode 2 video will post next week. Like I said, there'll be seven episodes total that'll set up the Mandalorian Season 3. We'll probably also get a bunch of Mandalorian characters crossing over like Grogu, Mando, maybe even Bo-Katan. Probably some other classic trilogy characters too. Maybe other classic bounty hunter characters as well. I know people want to see some of the classic bounty hunters come back. Everyone click here for my brand new Spider-Man No Way Home alternate ending and deleted scenes video. And click here for my Doctor Strange Multiverse of Madness trailer video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.